Welcome to the D.A.R.E. podcast, where it is all about helping people overcome anxiety and panic attacks. The D.A.R.E. app has over 1 million downloads and is free to download at dareresponse.com. Now, without further ado, here is the D.A.R.E. podcast. Oh, hi, guys. Hi. Uh, what's up? Good to see you. I was just introducing you to our members, but I did not mention a name yet. <laughs> <laughs> Secret oh, guest. Whole thing. Here you go, guys. Now, of course, everybody knew who's, who's going to be our special guest tonight, but I think that many of you are really, really excited to see Drew, aka the Anxious Truth, on our webinar tonight. So welcome, Drew. Thank you so much for attending. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. You guys have been so welcoming and so friendly. Thank you so much. We're not that friendly. And I'm not that excited. Well, I'm not that friendly. <laughs> Everybody knows you as whoever calls us. They're like, you know, that anxious truth guy. I'm like, yeah. Drew, that anxious truth guy. You must get that too. <laughs> that, that, that crazy dude with the microphone. Yeah. So? So we so have- welcome in. Yeah, we have already a lot of people attending from all around the world, which is always so funny to see where people call in from. Yeah, are you able to see Michelle the chats there, brutal. Drew? Can you see the yeah, chats? I just opened oh, it up because I saw Michelle is brutal come up. Yeah. <laughs> That's so good. <laughs> Me, we're like twinsies, really Drew. Me and you, we're like twinsies. Yeah. Like BFFs. And so that's why I know, Aida, you want to do a little like niceness disclaimer right before we get started because sometimes we maybe act a little lighthearted here and mm -hmm. there's a reason for it but it's not to dismiss the difficulty and how hard it feels and how awful it feels and how hard it is you're looking at three people who have been through it and back so we absolutely get it so the whole idea of us making it lighthearted is I don't think you guys want to see a webinar where it's like, how does that make oh you feel? God. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. No. I wish you were there. Let's go. See, because we're doing it again now. It's kind of jerky. But there's a reason for it because nobody came here to like get consolation. And, and that's kind of not our job. Job, and I know, Drew, you do the same thing. It's not to make you feel better. It's to help you heal from this habit right? To help you heal. And so sometimes healing doesn't always feel great. And so when we're speaking like that, it kind of like uh, accept this, uh, take this idea of like, we know it sucks and it feels really bad and hard, but almost to like start speaking the way we're speaking about those feelings, right? Yeah. Kind of like, yeah, I'm acting in a way to say, oh, those thoughts, Oh, oh, what about that thought? Oh, what about this one? So that maybe you start picking up my obnoxious Bronx, New York accent and you start using those same words because the same words you're using already are the words that are probably getting you stuck. Here's this feeling. When's it going to go away? What if it lasts forever? And so almost to kind of like set, set the scene to speak a little bit more like us, but maybe a little bit nicer. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Cool. So we have a bunch of questions that came in. Um, apologies, you guys, we will not be able to answer all of your questions, but we try when we answer one question to include the other questions as well. So kind of like answering them in group or in groups or categories. Yeah, so we went through and highlighted a lot of like we have almost 60 something questions. We have twice as many members that joined in. Um, so and so, yeah, I see uh, people asking about Drew. It's, I don't do you want to would you like to start off? Tell us because not maybe not everybody knows you, which I would find odd, but I don't know. Maybe there's some dare people that want to know a little bit more about you. I'm not really worth that my knowing that much about. But um, so yeah, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Drew Lynn Salata. I am creator and host of the Anxious Truth Podcast, which has actually gotten quite large. We went over two million downloads not too long wow. ago. Awesome. Yeah. And so I've also written a couple of books, a couple of three books on anxiety and anxiety recovery. And um, yeah, so this is my jam. So I, if the other you guys who know me know that I probably sound a whole lot like Michelle in terms of the, the way that she addresses this and Aida. Um, so yeah, I spend my time doing this, but I used to be you. So 
I spent 25 plus years of my life in and out of like really serious panic disorder and agoraphobia and clinical depression. And so I know all of the stuff. I've lived all the stuff. I was frozen in fear in my own bathroom, couldn't get out of bed, spent hours just standing at my front door, wondering if I could actually step out the front door, mm-hmm. couldn't get my own place of business. I was failing at like dad stuff and business stuff and just life in general. So I, I know how hard and scary and difficult all of this really is. And sometimes it feels like this is completely out of your control and you can't possibly get better because this monster is stalking you all the time. But I, I was there and back again. And I, and I know everything that I do is based on the idea that while we're asking people to do really difficult and scary things, I know that everybody can do it. We all have it in us. So it's called the anxious truth, the anxious truth, T-R-U-T-H, there you go. So just search it anywhere, you will find it immediately. So yeah, I spend my time now teaching on this topic and we're acting as a guide and an author and a podcaster and all of that stuff. So I'm happy to be here. And Michelle and I, we heard from from so many of our clients, hey, as Michelle said in the beginning, do you know that anxious truth guy? Well, yeah. The anxious truth guy. Oh, but yeah. (laughs) Yeah, he has good content. Oh, you should really do something with him. And a few months ago, we, we reached out to Drew and thought it would be so cool if we could to do something together. And here we are. Yeah, because, you know, again, I know I said this when the three of us talked the other day, but like, I think it's much more important to have like-minded people from like-minded programs sending the same message. So I don't care if you listen to Drew and not Michelle. And, and I almost kind of like it because, I seen people like before Aida joined there, like I would say something over and over and over again. And then here comes Aida. And then somebody will come on the call and said, you know what Aida said? She said, you should just accept and allow. I'm like, you know, I've been freaking telling you that for six months, but like sometimes you hear somebody else say something slightly different or in a different way and it just clicks. So our whole goal is to find all the like-minded programs to say, Sure, definitely listen to this guy. He's just reinforcing the same thing we are saying and vice versa. Dare is not to get rid of any feelings or thoughts or sensations. It's learning you're getting rid of anything. It's learning how to get rid of the fight of, not to diminish the feeling of. And so we might use different words, but we're really saying the same message. I'd say the difference between trying to feel better and get better. Yes. Feeling better is not the goal. Getting better is the goal. And feeling better is just the happy side effect of getting better. Yes. Yeah. Oh, it's exactly what we can say. It's like, it's a, it's a nice consequence, right? right? It, yeah. It's an ex, it ex, like you might accidentally become comfort, like become comfortable. Right. My words are all messed up out of coming out of my mouth. Comfort is a nice byproduct, but the goal is learning how to allow discomfort. And then you may accidentally become comfortable as like a nice byproduct of that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, exactly. yeah, so if we, if we speak about this topic more generally, this, this pursuit of happiness is what gets us in, in trouble in the first place. And mm-hmm. right? if we look at happiness as a direct life goal, so I, my goal is to be happy. What does that even mean? Right. And the problem with happiness is that it it goes away as soon as life storms come up and then happiness is nowhere to be found and then you're left with nothing so you need something deeper something more meaningful and we on dear we talk a lot about focusing on your values and we're going to touch on that today too because while you feel uncomfortable and anxiety is very very uncomfortable you need to do the right things to get your anxious mind and your resistance out of the way. But while you do that, now, how do you treat yourself and what do you engage in? Because sitting there and waiting for the anxiety to go away so that you can feel good enough again to live your life will just keep you stuck. So yeah. doing the right thing or letting go of the things that you are doing that are keeping you stuck and focusing on your values and the things that are meaningful to you that have nothing to do with happiness because happiness might come as you do those things or you might go to bed being happy that day or you might go to bed being tired and exhausted but you will still have done the things that are meaningful and valuable to you yeah right yeah. right i used to talk about uh the difference between we don't need happiness we need contentment and it's not about happiness it's about competency so no matter what situation you encounter you're always competent and capable and I always feel so strong that one of the lessons that we learn in this recovery process is that we learn that we are competent and capable and confident across multiple contexts. It doesn't matter what life is bringing at you. Yeah. We have one of our daily dares. It's, it's called the opposite of anxiety. And um, 
you know, people think it's calm or fearless and it's yeah. not the opposite of anxiety is trust. And that usually hits home a lot for like a lot of people, because we just lose trust in ourselves. You lose trust in your body. You're what if I can't cope, how to deal. And it's really like growing. How do you grow trust back in your body? You start leaving it alone. You let it do the things that it's doing without fighting through it, without trying to prevent bad things from happening. And yeah, as your trust, as you grow trust in your body, you, you grow confidence and it's confidence. It's like growing your tolerance to feel discomfort rather than tolerating through discomfort. Right. right. Cool. So how right. about we head into some questions, you guys? <laughs> so I have them here on my phone, just so you guys know, I'm not just posting pictures of myself here. I'm looking at your questions. Drew, I'm sure you've probably heard all these questions too. So we're doing this live. Nobody's rehearsed anything. You don't even know what we're going to ask, um, yeah. which I'm sure, but I'm sure you already do know what we're going to ask. So <laughs> let's probably. see. All right, go ahead. I, you wanna? Do you wanna go? You wanna pick one? Yeah, I can start. <laughs> oh, I can, oh, here I'll do this. Oh, mine. This is the green one, right? Okay. Here's the first one. It's related to social anxiety. How do I quickly? I want you guys to pay attention to the words. How these questions are worded. I highlighted some of these questions for a reason to see how, like, all of these, the way things are phrased. And this was my post yesterday. Like, pay attention to struggling with. I, how do I cope with, how do I dare through this? All the whys, why, 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 tolerating. Um, those are all the fight words. And so it's never going to be about what comes on the other side of those words. I kind of don't care when it comes to dare, right? Somebody told me this last week. They're like, dare don't care. I'm like, that's a nice and not nice t-shirt, but <laughs> it doesn't matter kind of what you're fighting. Remember dare, and especially for people that maybe are new with these webinars, because there's so many people on today. Dare is for the fight of, not to get rid of the feeling of. So everybody's going to be sending different messages on different things they're fighting, but dare is for this, this to go from here to here, to letting go. So this first one, so pay attention to these words. How do I quickly calm anxious blushing? It takes a long time to calm my skin down after talking myself through dare. So what do you guys post it in the comments? Where do you see? Where do you hear? What, what do you see? What's oh, please don't speak too fast for people who are not English. Sorry, I speak too fast for people who do speak English. So. I get it all the time. Slow down, slow down. <laughs> oh, 7% slower, Michelle. <coughs> Sorry, 7%, 7 slower. 7% slower. Hey, look at that. You guys are all right. Hey, that's a great idea for a that's book. You should write a book about that. Yeah, I'll write 9% slower. <laughs> <laughs> So guys, so would you hear that? So when I have my little red pen in my head and I'm like kind of circling and starring all these words in my mind, I see, how do I quickly calm anxious blushing? That means, what that really means is something's happening in my body. I don't like it and I need to quickly get rid of it, right? Do you guys see what's wrong with blushing? Yeah. Nothing, nothing. nothing. And so it's this idea of you're not, daring through drew you must have people pop on your form all the time that post dare and you're probably and they're probably like but dare says follow these steps and how do i use this and how do i guys if that's how you're asking the questions that's not you're using the wrong tool you're using a screwdriver to hammer in a nail yeah dare is to not stop blushing i tried dare but i'm still blushing and it didn't work because i still feel scared it's not what we're teaching here dare means oh you're blushing this is dare okay and leave it, leave it. It's the fight of that blush. You've decided I, here's the sensation I have in my body. And I kind of highlighted this one because it goes to any other sensation questions. All the answers are coming in on the chat, by the way. So if anybody who's dealing with this, you can see all the other members writing blush harder, blush harder. There's nothing wrong with anxious blushing. Ignore it. It's not even anxious blushing. It's just blushing. Blush. Yeah. yeah. So Phil, no, everybody's sick of me. Tell, what do you think, Drew? See, what do you think, Drew? Nobody wants so, us anymore, Aida. Wow. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm the new guy. I'm like the, the uh, you know, the interesting guy here. So <laughs> don't feel bad. So my thought on that is, yes, I hear about blushing all the time. I know people feel like if you ask an anxious person to, you know, what their biggest fear is, everybody's going to have a different one. 
they're going to come and you guys know this. I'm not telling everybody that I already know. So people are afraid of their heart. Some people are afraid of the stomach and the nausea, the dizziness, the jelly legs, the blushing, whatever it happens to be. But in the end, the issue here is, and I'll just echo what Michelle said, it's not about trying to calm it down, mm -hmm. right? The issue really here is if I just let the blushing happen and I continue to engage in what it is I want to engage with, so that's an attention thing. It's a focus thing. I'm going to put my attention on the, the situation that I'm in because more than one event could be happening in this at the same time in that context. I could be anxious and blushing and thinking about that, which is just an event that's happening in the context that you're in. You make it the most important event and the only event that matters. But it is possible to take your attention and put it on the conversation that you're having or the meal that you're having or the concert that you're watching, whatever it happens to be even though you still feel that blushing and you still hear the thinking about it. But if you let that go, the lesson becomes, I didn't do anything to calm the blushing and I blushed, but no horrible consequence came out of this. And so I was able to literally turn my back on that fear of the blushing. I was able to just leave it be. And there was no terrible consequence other than I was thinking, oh, I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. And I use that a lot you know, recognize the process, oh, I'm thinking, oh, I'm feeling, as opposed to the content, I feel this, I am thinking this. Right. So the blushing is not really the problem. It's the way you interpret it. This is terrible. I'm blushing. The Emmett mm -hmm. will tell you the worst thing to happen in the recorded history of mankind is vomiting, you know, or heart, heart, it's the worst thing. Cardiophobia is the worst thing. For blush, for you, blushing seems to be the worst fate possible, but it's, it's truly not. And if you allow it to happen, you learn that Nothing bad actually comes out of it other than you think about it. And your body reacts because when we're upset, our bodies do things like blush. Some people are blushers. Like it's okay. Right. Too and much. you don't get to stop it. See, that's that's where everybody gets stuck. Right. You don't, you don't calm down. You can't calm yourself down. When you let go, your body calms itself down. What you can do is crank it up, right. you can keep it going. But see, this is where the paradox is. The more you try and stop blush, the more the focus is on the blush because you focus on what's most important. And yeah. so it's this idea of like, oh, I notice I'm blushing right now. And now I, I notice that I've noticed. So I can, can then choose to sit and keep staring at blushing or yeah. I, can, I get to change this while this stays in the room. Guys, this is not to get rid of blushing, derealization, depersonalization, nausea, stuffy nose, any of that stuff. It's oh, I notice this thing is here. If I treat it as danger, I will stay focused on it and my body will keep pumping out fear because fear helps you fight danger and helps you see danger. And so it's my job to notice that feeling and, and I, get to, I don't get to choose what, I, what this is, but I get to choose this part. This is the movable part, not this. Right. I was uh, used, uh, I, I, I'll throw in real quickly and then I, you know, I'm sorry, I had to step on you a little bit. A couple of days ago on Instagram, I, I posted an analogy about a horse. Like people are like, well, I don't understand. How am I supposed to turn away from that? How am I supposed to just let it be? How am I supposed to be? Well, because you still hear it and you still feel it. So your assumption is faulty in that if I hear it and feel it, it must be the most important thing. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, let's assume that a horse comes up and nudges, you, keeps nudging you, keeps nudging you. Oh, you I like can, that. But you can feel that horse nudging you. You're not going to not feel it because he's going to keep doing it, but you can continue to do something else. That is acknowledgement. I'm acknowledging, oh, there's a horse nudging me. If you jump on the horse and ride it for two hours, <laughs> that is paying attention. So I can, I can choose whether or not I jump on the horse and let him drag me around for two hours. That's the difference. So yeah, it's not easy because the horse is going to keep nudging you and nudging you and nudging you. You can feel that while you do something else. That is possible. If you don't start from that premise, you're going to really struggle, whether you're mm -hmm. using a four-letter acronym or not that's going to be a struggle. If your insistence is I must fuse with those thoughts yep. and I must fuse with those feelings and I must act upon them specifically, you're going to struggle. You have to assume that I might be, that that might not be true. I have to consider that it's possible for me to pay attention to something else. Right. Even while I feel, feel this thing. Yes. Exactly. And always notice the urge to control something. It's a lot is about control. So I feel something where I notice something that I do not like and I want to get rid of it. And as a result, I try to control it in some form. And that's a real intense urge to do that. But you, you have to get to the point where you notice the sensation or the thought and you notice your urge to control, but then mm -hmm. deliberately choose to not do that, but to say, you know what, nothing to do about this. I, I cannot control it and I must not control it. I am fine and I let go. I surrender to my body 
taking care of this. And this feels scary and it's hard to do because that, that urge is very strong, but it also feels like, oh, but if I let go of control, then, oh my God, what if it overwhelms me? What if it gets too intense? What if this happens? What if that, what if that happens? But the only way really to prove to yourself that you are safe and nothing, that nothing happens is to not scratch that, that itch, to, to resist that urge and to leave it be. Endure it and increase your, your, your tolerance for discomfort, you guys. Cool. Absolutely. Awesome. All right. That was question number one. <laughs> <laughs> what time you go to bed tonight, Drew? <laughs> <laughs> so remember, if we don't get to your questions, the answers are out there in Dareland somewhere. And if they're not on our, um, they are on our page. They are, I'm sure, also in the Anxious Truth Land too, because we are just, the whole point of picking these questions is to just give context to how to let go of the fight, right? So it's blushing, it could be a leg cramp, it could be eye floaters, it could be sensory motor stuff, it could be whatever. So just know if we don't get to your specific question, please see how um, it's the same approach, no matter what everybody's struggling with, the focus is the struggle, not what you're struggling with. And so it's on the YouTube channel, it's on our Instagram pages, there's all the free content information, the information is out there. So do a search through the Facebook page and all of these answers, if you didn't find it, should come up. Right. Yeah, so if we talk about how to address depersonalization or dualization that occurs in the evening, it's the same for the mornings, yeah. or when you wake up at night, or when you're at home, or when you're somewhere out, out and about doing something, it's always the same right yeah. because we get that almost every time people submit questions we respond to these questions in a general sense and then later everybody's like oh my question wasn't answered yes but we just talked about health anxiety for like 25 minutes <laughs> it's the same thing yeah see somebody down low which we're, i won't address specifically but wrote almost the same thing but about my hand shaking in public or my hand shaking when i'm giving a presentation so it's the same exact, just kind of fill in the blanks, kind of like Mad Libs, right? You just replace the noun with a different one. So instead of blushing, it's handshaking. And there's a good chance that you don't want those things to happen because of like the bigger uh, fight of embarrassment. What will people think of me? And so it's just sort of like, you know, switch the words to whatever the other word is. So if I, we didn't talk about shaking, it's the same thing. It's going to be the same response. I think one of the things, and I know we got questions to get to, but this might help conceptualize this. I did a podcast episode on this not too long ago. Between, are you learning? Are you are you learning the principles of recovery, or are you asking for instructions? And most people, in the beginning, it's totally fine. Everybody wants instructions in the beginning. Everybody wants a step by step. Tell me exactly what to do for this and this and this and this. I get that, but as you go down the road, instructions are not recovery. Mm -hmm. Steps are not recovery. Like when you understand the principles that, that are being taught, like, oh, I, why I have to do this, it does become a whole lot easier to make that response portable across multiple contexts, multiple symptoms and multiple challenges. So it's so much better to really get underneath this and say, okay, before I keep asking, tell me exactly what to do step-by-step, letter-by-letter, uh, mm -hmm. why am I doing this? Why are these yes. people telling me to do this? Because yes. I can make that portable. That yep. helps a lot. So I very rarely address, I mean, honestly, I mean, we're allowed to disagree to certain, I don't like acronyms. I don't like four letters because see the questions, but how do I do, but how do yep. I, have, what does it look like? Those are instructions. I would prefer to say, let's talk about why we do this and learning to do that. So sometimes that helps. Like it's not about daring or Claire Weeksing or Drewing. Claire Weeksing. <laughs> right. It's about how do I float? It's no, yes. why are you floating? Why? So right. That's important. right. Yes. But if you, you know, if you pick those acronyms apart, yeah. you have D for diffuse, which refers to cognitive diffusion. So everything, every exercise that helps you to diffuse from anxious thoughts is helpful. A stands for allow whatever you're feeling in every context. And the R stands for, for the run towards, meaning the, um, oh, what's the word? Michelle, help me. Arousal reappraisal. Arousal reappraisal part. What's your and favorite phrase? I did. <laughs> it's always late. I'm six hours for you. <laughs> and the anybody's favorite phrase. Yeah. No, but I think those. No, I think it's true. 
the the st the steps they refer to concepts what drew yeah. just said so it's yeah. not about taking yeah. dare the acronym and say oh how i do it through this or through this but how do i apply the concepts right. the allow concept the diffuse concept the run towards concept to my particular sensation or situation right. we kind of worked it the way of like because we'd say just leave it float let it be right that stuff and it was but how right how like like, and so like, it's almost like taking something that somebody might do automatically. And like, how would I explain to somebody how to do it automatic? Like something I do automatically, I might have to stop and think about it. So I often reference my, my oldest daughter had to have speech therapy um, when she was little and she just, her sounds were just not right. And so the speech therapist came and was like, so we're going to practice the F sounds because my daughter's like four, five, six. I'm like, how the hell you say F? you don't you can't say an f word in this house are you kidding me that's like all my favorite words start with f so uh she's like so when you say the f sound you have to do you know do you guys know how to how to say f what do you do to say f you have to really think about it right like, you, you don't think about it right you don't think about it right so we don't think about it because we know how to say f but my daughter did not so the speech therapist was like you have to bite your lower lip and blow. She goes, so we call it bite and blow. And so, and if, so everybody, everybody wants to make F sound, right? So do bite and blow. That's how you make F. So my daughter just could, and I'm like, just say, f -f 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 -f. But it was like, it almost had to be like broken down to steps to then get it going, but then let go of the steps. Yeah. Your job is to not do, okay, accepting all of these anxious thoughts. And now I'm going to run toward. And now it's kind of like breaking, well, this is how you make the F sound. And then you just practice making the F sound a lot over and over again. I had a video on like teaching people how to wave. Like it's like, well, you put your fingers like this, and then you put your fingers like this, and you go down. Well, how many times? Three times? Oh, well, but Barry says wave this way. And Michelle says wave this way. And so if I do it, how many times? just wave, just start waving this. These are steps to kind of get you out the door. And then it's literally four steps on how to do nothing. Yeah. Like how to do nothing about the feeling you're trying to get rid of. So any speech therapists out there listening in? You no, must know. I, I want to learn how to do all the letters now. <laughs> you don't know. See, then it's like, well, how do I say F? I don't know. And then you see any speech therapist or teachers out there, you see, once you get it, then it's repetition. And you're not going to get it. And so every time she would come to the house for an hour, she would check in and give some skills. But then all the work was done in between those times that she came. And so that's why, like, sure, book a call with us and join a program. But and I'm going to give you some information and work on implementation. But all the work is going to be what you're reinforcing once you're not talking to me. The work's done in between phone calls, not on them. Yeah. Yeah, so you look at these these tips as a basic recipe, okay, for I don't know Italian an Italian dish. But if you want to make it something more special, do your thing. Like use your herbs and stuff. But it will always be you need the basic ingredients to make this work. And those are the concepts we just mentioned before. Cool. So let's <clears throat> jump to our next question. Sorry. When I have a panic attack, I feel like I'm about to lose control and I will shout and scream and I feel just out of control and I feel the need to escape as soon as possible. Please help me. Um, who asked that question? Ate, I, I hope I pronounced that right. So of course, when you have a panic attack, you will feel like that. You will feel like you're about to lose control and do something crazy because what is happening? Adrenaline is supposed to make you feel that way. It's the runaway hormone. If you feel like punching somebody in the face, you are experiencing much more nor adrenaline. But adrenaline is about fleeing. Flee, run as fast as you can. So it's actually doing its job perfectly. But because your brain can't um, recognize an external danger, something else becomes the context and that is you. So there you are stuck with all this energy, no recognizable context. Of course, your anxious brain is doing its job by saying, oh, what the fuck is wrong with you? Maybe you are going crazy. Maybe you're about to scream or to shout. In your case, it's screaming and shouting. In, in for some other people, it's, it's about, oh my God, what if you start stabbing somebody? What if you jump out of the car? What if you jump off the bridge or the balcony or whatever? 
right? the content does matter, but it's always the same. There's a lot of energy, no recognizable context, energy stays stuck, and you're not moving. Think about in prehistoric times when the fight or flight response was activated, people were moving. They were not sitting there or lying in bed, right? They were moving, they were doing something. And you were maybe just sitting or standing there and enduring this energy. So it's it stays stuck and you become the context. So you become the danger part. And how to help you through this is all the things that we're teaching people in today's webinar and Drew on his podcast and on his content and uh, Dear on all its contents. It's about recognizing what is going on in your body, then not fighting it. Because when you start to fight that energy, you're basically fighting yourself. And your emotional brain senses that and says, oh my God, he or she, she's still fighting. Okay, let me help her fight even more. So here I'm going to give you more adrenaline and more cortisol. And this is how you stay stuck in that loop. So what you want to do is everybody who experiences panic attacks, I always say the best thing for a panic attack is to really to get excited by your own energy, to understand that, oh, this is my energy in motion. Nothing else. It's nothing else. It's no illness. It's no crazy thing that is going on. It's just my energy that is in movement at the moment. Okay. Do I have to, to do something against it? Absolutely not. So I can stay like this and say, oh, I'm just going to wait till it passes. Or I can say, yeah, okay, bring it on. Let's go. Let's, I'm having this anyway. I'm experiencing this anyway, so I can either enjoy it, do my best to show to my emotional brain with my posture that, yeah, actually everything is fine. Or I can do, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, I hope this passes soon. The first, both are going to be uncomfortable, but the one is going to get you somewhere and the other one is going to, going to keep you stuck. So practice getting excited and always remember it's just your own energy. It's not something external that is doing that to you. It's no illness or anything else, just your energy in motion, and you can allow that to happen. And everything that goes up will come down. People always fear that, oh God, a panic attack will arise, it's gonna peak, and then stay here and stay here forever and ever and ever. Like that never happens, ever, ever. It's biologically impossible to stay on that high wave for such long periods of time. So it will come down. And since it's going up anyway, you better practice to get excited by it and be comfortable in that discomfort for a while. And with time and practice, you will actually um, perceive that energy as something that is cool and that is refreshing or exciting. It takes a while, but definitely worth practicing. We should address that person, the assertion, this is important, I think, the assertion that I don't have a choice. When, when I panic, I don't have a choice. I automatically begin screaming, screaming and crying. I throw myself on the floor. I've had people who literally say, I must, somehow they learn that I must go to ground. I know people have literally put themselves on the ground and they feel that it's, it's, there's no choice. They have no control there. They must do that. But that's one of those first assertions that you have to really challenge before you can dare or do anything. You have to first say, well, maybe that's not true. Maybe I do have a choice. Now that choice exists in a very small space that there's the power in this process actually exists. Tremendous amounts of power come from a very tiny space. Mm -hmm. And we would measure that space, not physically, but temporally. It comes in a space that's no more than about two or three seconds wide. So yeah. when you have that initial boil over, when it becomes panic, you feel it simmering and boom, or it comes out of the bloom, boom you do have that initial response. You can't stop that part. We're human beings. You can't stop that. What happens in the two or three seconds after that matters. And when you recognize that there is a moment that I get to make a decision, am I going to declare myself powerless and that I can't, I must scream and cry and wave my hands and call for help and throw myself on the ground? Or do, can I try it a different way? You have to recognize a tiny slice of time when a choice is made. If you, maybe you make the choice this time to scream and cry and throw yourself on the ground. Okay, well, the next time after that experience, it's so important to loop back and say, well, what can I learn from that? Like I made that choice again. I made that choice again. It's not your fault. I'm not always blaming you, but you have to recognize that there is a choice before you can do any steps. And before you can do any of the stuff, you have to recognize that moment. It's right. really important. It's super hard, but it matters. And if you don't accept that first, all of what we're talking about, all of us will be really hard for you to deal with. Right. And remember what's your choice and what's not like, I can't choose how right. I just felt, Correct. but I can choose how I respond to how I felt right. The dare response, everybody. Right. Like, so it's like, 
like Claire Weeks, right? Um, first fear and second, second fear and flash fear yeah. and second fear. I call it reaction and response because here's the, <gasps> and then the now what? And so we go, <gasps> and then we go right to why? Oh my God, why? What's going to happen? How does it feel? Nope. That's where that we, we, we call, call, talk about it like that little sliver. And yeah. from in the beginning, it's fast. It's reaction response, reaction response. <gasps> I, feel, I feel like I have to leave. I must leave right now. So again, your body sends you fear to attend to danger. The, the problem that's missing, the piece that's missing with the panic attack is that the danger is missing. The problem is missing. So you're full of fear without anything to fight. So we turn inward and we fight the fear. And so we're left with all this fight energy and we're fighting the part of us that helps us fight. And yeah. so identified, I use, I have this little flow charty thing and it's like, okay, when you don't know what to do and here comes that rush of energy, look, what's happening right now? I say, is there danger? Anybody on the chat might know, I say a lot, are there bees or does it feel like bees, right? I have this sense of urgency. That's nice. Well, is there a murderer to be running from? Great. I'll use the sense of urgency to attend to danger. The problem is we're attending to the sense of urgency as if the sense of urgency requires an urgent response. And it, and it doesn't. Like fear actually does not need to be attended to. Danger needs to be attended to. Fear needs to be noticed and used to fight danger or left alone while it regulates itself. Yeah. And I'll challenge you guys to, to try this out. Next time you have a panic attack and you know, oh, it's coming, use those two to three seconds because that is really your choice and how you perceive this. You can either say in those two to three seconds, oh my God, not again, or you know what, bring it on. And just notice how different that experience is from, from the one of, of resistance and oh my God, will it soon pass? It really makes all the difference. Right. Because you are responsible for your actions and your behaviors and the words that come out of your mouth. Those are all your choices. So I feel like I have to, okay. I feel like I have to, do I have to, am I on fire or does it feel like I'm on fire? Right. If I'm scrolling for three hours on Google, searching for every worst case scenario, every time I put my finger on that phone, I am choosing to do this. And so even if you choose to do it, at least own that. Take, make that your first step. Like, like, I feel like I need to leave right now and I'm choosing to leave and I'm choosing to click on this link and I'm choosing to do this. So at least that opens up your ability to see that I have choices, right? I can choose to keep searching or I can choose to not keep searching. And then it puts the power back into your choices lie in your behaviors and your actions and how you treat, how you feel. You don't get to choose how you feel. And we've crossed it up. Here's this feeling. I'm trying to take action to not have this feeling, but this is what you get to be in charge of. Not really this. This is the stuff you leave alone. Some of it, I think, is in that moment where you have to make that choice because so much of the stuff, it's easy for us after the fact right. to go back and, and teach concepts and explain what it all is. But in the heat of the moment, you guys, I'm not telling you guys anything you don't already know. When the amygdala is in charge, your lizard brain is in charge, that reasoning part, that prefrontal cortex offline, because mm -hmm. nature wasn't, wasn't dumb enough to let us reason our way out of actual danger. So you almost have to just say, Michelle and Aida and Drew and whoever, all there's, I'm sure there are plenty of members in the DARE community that are further down the road in recovery or have recovered and are generous enough with their time to try and help other people. You are literally at that moment almost just going to say, I'm just going to have to trust Michelle here. That's the only choice you have. I'm going to have to trust the people who came before me. I know I want to scream and wave my hands and throw myself on the ground and call an ambulance. But, and I could try to remember amygdala and lizard brain and prefrontal cortex <laughs> and, and emotions, or I could just say, I'm going to trust Michelle. I'm going to trust Aida. I'm going to trust Drew. I'm going to trust my friend in the DARE group or in Drew's Facebook group. Bring it when that punch is coming, like, okay, hit it right there. Mm -hmm. be okay, so go ahead. <laughs> and really, that's what it comes down to. You're trusting the people that came before you. When I was in the thick of it, I had to trust the people who came before me because I know it felt like, I like your bee analogy. That's cool. I felt like there were bees. Mm -hmm. I had to trust the people who came before me who said, I promise there's no bees. I use like a, a net. Like you think you're on the edge of a, an endless precipice of doom. But we're all saying, but if you step off, it's only three feet and there's a nice cushy net down there. You don't right. know it until you hit it. All right, I'm going to have to trust these guys and go ahead, hit me. Go ahead. It's the only choice you can make. You can't run through all that reasoning that we're talking about because it's too fast. Right. Like lizard brain is much faster than your reasoning brain. Mm -hmm. So 
you Try can't that. trust, if you can't trust, because sometimes even that is too hard, surrender. Yes. Just surrender to it. That's Not to us, but, but to your body or to whatever is going to happen, right. right? And many people experience that, and it's usually when they hit rock bottom, like they've tried all the things that, that, out there, that are out there yeah. to, to get rid of whatever they're fighting, and nothing's working. You know, it's like Barry ex explained in his book, right, that that moment of rock bottom, like, okay, you know what, then take me. I can't do this any longer. And then it's like, yeah. Oh. And that's when you put somebody finally <laughs> lets go. Because when you're trying to let go, if you're trying to surrender, if you're trying to any of this, it's too much trying. And, and surrender doesn't mean give up. Surrender means let go of the fight of. Yeah. All right, we've done about two questions. <laughs> yeah, it's always okay. like that. You 40 yeah. minutes, no problem. And I think I think if we could um, give Drew some questions to answer because I saw people in the chat saying- Yeah, it turns out nobody actually wants to hear from us at all today. So oh. Drew, it's all you, man, you've got all the rest of them. Let's just type in when minutes. you call on us. So, uh, I'm gonna treat like, Jim Shut Jim up, Jim. Michelle, shut up, Aida. All right, bring it, what do you got? Okay, um, you know what? This next one is almost like the last one. Um, experience resistance to full acceptance when panic attacks and triggering situations for sitting in traffic. It's the same, same thing, which we kind of just answered on the last one. I feel like I'm trapped. I feel like I have to get out. So it's, I think we kind of just answered that one. So let's go to the next one. How do you diffuse your anxiety from guilt for past mistakes? I've done what I can to make things right and just want to get back to living my life, but anxiety is constantly attacking me about it. Okay. It. Great question. Yeah, it is a good question. So not, I, mean, I don't want to speak for Dare because I don't represent Dare, but I would say in this situation, I would say, I always say not everything is a floating and accepting problem. Not everything is a surrender problem. Not everything is a Dare problem. Yes. So yes. Okay, there you go. Thank you. I appreciate that. So sometimes this is not a diffusing problem. This is not a, how do I have a method to do this? The advice I usually give people in that situation is sometimes the, the rumination or the regret or the guilt is over something that the anxiety disorder has brought about. I missed out on my kids' concerts and I was not, a, you know, I wasn't the best wife or husband or whatever it happens to be, right? In which case I say, well, look, you're going to have that guilt and that you'll have to work through that. That's not a diffusing, accepting, surrendering problem. But the best way you can approach that is to do your best work to get better so that you don't have to, not only are you worried about the past and the things you may have missed out because of your anxiety, you can eliminate the worry about the future if you're actually working toward getting better. If it's just a life event that happened, you know, like if something happened in a relationship, it had nothing to do with anxiety. I would say that that's not necessarily a dare question. Like anxiety, I would say anxiety is not attacking you. You're, that's a, one of those things where, I mean, I don't want to get super technical here, but like I, if I, if thinking is your primary way of interacting with your problems, which for many human beings is, it becomes our default. Then if you labor under the assumption that if I think more about it, I can solve my problem. Mm -hmm. That's kind of out of metacognitive, metacognitive therapy, you guys know, right? So like rumination is all about thinking is my go-to to stay yep. safe thinking is my go-to. And then the worst part about that is you think about a past problem, can't solve it because you can't change the past. You think thinking is the way to go. Then you realize, oh, my relationship with thinking just flipped because thinking isn't helping me. It's causing, it's making me anxious. Now I have that problem to solve. How would I solve the problem of being anxious about thinking? Oh, well, I think when I solve problems. So I'll think about how to not think about, how to not think about. Mm -hmm. So in a way you have to really disengage in metacognitive therapy. You would be taught to disengage from that and engage outward somewhere else. I will have to be guilty while I make a chicken sandwich. That's just the way it's going to have to be right now. I'll have to be guilty while I listen to this song. I'll have to be guilty while I read this book. That's just the way it's going to have to be. It's the process of turning back around and thinking that analyzing the guilt or analyzing the event can change it, I think is part of the problem. But I think it falls outside the purvey of a lot of what stuff that we are talking about. I don't know if that you guys agree with that. Yes, I think two two things I would like to add to, to what Drew said, which, which was wonderful. So I think most people think that guilt is something bad. It's not. Guilt is feedback. Hey, yeah. dude, you did something wrong. You could have done something differently and you didn't. So guilt is not to be seen as something that is bad. It's just feedback and a good thing. And if we could appreciate that we feel guilt uh, that shows us, hey, I could have done something wrong. But now it depends on how how do I appraise that? So do I say, oh my God, I freaking loser. How could I do that? Why did I do that? Or I can say, yeah, you know what? I own up to that. I take responsibility. That was my fault. I fucked up. I did. Yes, period. No comma. 
period, I did. So I feel bad about that, but that moment, the guilt usually dissolves. When you own up to your mistakes and really take 100% responsibility and accept that you are a flawed human being who will always make, make mistakes, you will feel totally different about your failures and your shortcomings. So that's right. the first. And the other thing is that it could also be now, I don't know that from, from your question, but sometimes it can be an OCD thing. Now, I don't know if, if, if that's in your, if that's your case, but if you feel that the thing that you have done, you're owning up to it, it's fine. And you're trying to do your best to, to make it okay, but that it can, it comes back as like an intrusive thought that's a little bit different there you would say oh yes i was so guilty look at how much i fucked up please remind me all the time don't make me ever forget come on bring it on but you would address it with kind of like an exposure thing if it's an intrusive thought thing but if it's what we just talked about and, and drew and what, what i said those two things combined should get you where you want to be yeah and it's another it's just a fight of a different feeling so with dare and anxiety 90 percent of what we talk about is a fight of fear but if you, if you talk more, right, we fight, we treat sad the same way, we fight, we treat grief the same way, guilt, yeah. you feel guilty, whether you like it or not, that's how you feel. And, but based on like what I'm getting from this question is like, I need, I need to get rid of this guilt so I can get back into life. No, you need to get back into life while you feel guilty and just bring guilt along with you. It's a feeling that's there. And again, we're not you doing anything to get rid of feelings. Like uh, it's just not possible. If you're trying to get rid of it, you'll find it more. But I have, I have some posts on this somewhere, uh, somewhere on Instagram. But like, once you've like Drew, like you were saying, like you go back, you make you make amends with whatever you've done, and then and then you let go of your own fight of yourself. Because here you are here. Yes, that thing happened there. And in order, kind of like forgiveness means to kind of like let go of, like acknowledge it. And then leave it because then we stay here in the present while the past thing happened and just keep looping and looping. It did. And then we turn it into shame. Not, I just did something bad. Now it means I'm a bad person. And then I'm going to fight that. And we're just very good at trying to fight it away. And it's not, yeah, I feel really guilty. That's okay. That's okay. That's how I feel. You acknowledge the present feeling and then you continue to engage in life with that present feeling. Right. There you go. There you go. Cool. <laughs> all right okay here's our next one my anxiety was triggered by hyper awareness oh is this the right one ada am mm. i on the right one my anxiety was triggered by <laughs> hyper awareness ocd i've never had ocd before triggered by uh withdrawal the sorry i have to go back and forth. the hyper awareness anxiety seems to have triggered depersonalization that hasn't gone away these are so many questions come in on that Hyper awareness, derealization, intrusive thoughts. Um, how can I learn to live? How can I learn to live with this? It seems like I am stuck ruminating about how I, about how I am always ruminating. The meta, yeah, yeah. There's a picture out there of Michelle and Meta Michelle. Even though I know my thoughts are not true or helpful, I can't seem to reengage with life. Sorry, I know this is a long question. Thank you. So hyper awareness, OCD, and then ruminating about the ruminating about the hyper awareness of the OCD, and why can't I stop doing this? You get, you get a lot of similar questions like this, Drew? Yeah, all the time. I mean, I never <laughs> claim any special expertise on OCD. So I always want to, you know, put that out there. There's a lot of very highly qualified people who specifically deal with OCD, which would be great. But the one thing that I usually point out is, you know, those cognitive distortions run rampant. Like I can't seem to engage with life, but you engaged with life long enough to write a very intelligent and lengthy question. So often, <laughs> sometimes it's a matter of like, no, you actually, believe it or not, are engaging with life. You just don't like how it feels when you do that. So sometimes just that little recognition that like, oh, wait, I am actually doing my days. I am taking care of my kids. I am at my job. I am doing my studies or whatever it is that you do. I don't feel very good while I'm doing those things, but it's probably important to shift from like, I'm trapped here to, mm -hmm. well, no, I spend a lot of time here and I don't like how that feels, but I'm still also out here. So I would say, I don't have any specific answers for that, but I would say at least start with, you know, hey, I, I am actually engaging with life. I am capable of doing that. So I, I do have a leg up more than I think I do. I just don't really like how it feels when I do that. that would, that's what I would say initially to that. Yeah. And it kind of ties in. I see somebody's comment came in about it's obsession and rumination. And it's like, you're not going to 
get out of your own head by spending more time thinking about how I'm going to get out of my own head. That's an action and behavior. That's, you know, you guys usually see me pick up the sign. It's not the thought. It's how much more, how, where's my focus going after that? How much of my attention is being sent to that thought? How much of my energy, how much time am I spending internally engaged? And how much time am I just putting up up the motions out here? And so we're in here, like, I have a hyper awareness, right? There's awareness and then anxiety kind of like brightens up that light bulb. So now we are, have like a heightened state of awareness, right? After a scary movie, you hear more things in your house. You hear all the creaks. And so you, with a brighter light, you're able to notice more things. Still fine, still not a problem. We kind of get into ter- that territory where we get stuck where it's now I've noticed stuff I don't like, and now I need to do something about it. I need to pay very close attention to the things I don't like because I don't like them and I don't want to notice them anymore. And so you accidentally stop noticing things because you stop treating them as important. We take it the wrong, we do it the wrong way. It's I need to stare at the thing I'm trying to stop noticing and then keep checking to see if it's gone. And then that's how we kind of get stuck in that loop of rumination and obsession. It's that's the actions and behaviors that I can move my focus from must do something about this thing, this noticeable thing, not actionable thing, but it's the doing that's keeping you stuck. So it doesn't really matter what the content of the thought is. It matters on how much time, focus, energy, attention I'm giving here. And then in, you would become engaged where you're, where you're involved the most. So the whole idea of go live life means get yourself involved in life, not to get rid of this, not for distraction, right? Distraction is great because you don't think about it for a minute, but it's like giving a kid a lollipop to shut up. Kid's going to have a million lollipops because you're attending to the wrong thing. Kid doesn't need to be quiet, right? So the job is the goal is to like, oh, I'm gonna go play a board game with my kids, not to not think of these thoughts, but to just literally play a board game and use your senses and get involved and just be more here because we're putting on the motions here and spending a lot of time engaged here. I mean, some of that too, like it's a drive to solve the problem. Yeah, they need to solve this problem. Okay, well, you could solve the problem if you want. Like, I guess I understand that drives a lot of this. And you think that solving Mm -hmm. the problem will be thinking, I'll solve the problem up here. Okay, let's assume that you do want to solve the problem. I know we're talking about never making it go away, but if you want to solve that problem, there actually are, there is a way to solve the problem, which is to stop trying to stop trying to solve the problem. So I know that sounds a little (laughs) bit ridiculous and facetious. You must give in to your problem solving. Like I would say we really need to disengage from that problem solving drive. That's not necessarily productive because life is not necessarily a problem to be solved. But if you want to look at it in the context of solving a problem, okay, I'll solve the problem by not solving. By the not problem. solving the problem. That <laughs> helps. I've seen people, oh, okay, this is how I'll fix it by not fixing it. They can right. get that a little bit. So maybe that helps. Don't know. I yeah, got about- rumination. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, I was going to say, I, just, I got about seven minutes from I'm going to have to hit the eject button on you guys. Okay. <laughs> oh yeah, we only, we go for the hour. Okay. And you know, guys, keep in mind, rumination has two, two main reasons. The one is in, in pure O, it's the compulsion part right, of OCD. It's rumination. So if, if it's that what you're experiencing, then try any form of ERP or exercise from ERP that will help you with that. The other form of, or the, the other main reason for rumination is not wanting to feel. And it's an avoidance behavior. If I am trying to avoid a feeling, I must turn to an alternative. And in that case, it's rumination. So I don't want to feel this, but I keep thinking about it. So instead of it being here where I can feel it, it gets stuck here. And I'm like, but I'm I'm ruminating so much. Why am I ruminating? You're not feeling. Ask yourself the next time when you find yourself ruminating uh, about anxiety or a sensation, ask yourself, am I in resistance mode or am I in a working state? Working state is to say, yeah, you know what? This is painful, but, and Paula Smith said this so beautifully, Michelle, on yesterday's call, she said, when I'm in working state, anxiety becomes uncomplicated. It's uncom- It's still there, it's still painful, but it's uncomplicated. Mm-hmm, but when mm-hmm. I resist it, it becomes painful and very, very complicated. And when you feel your anxiety so complicated and you find yourself in your head all the time, it's usually a clear sign that you are not feeling what you should be feeling. And by feeling, I mean truly allowing it, processing it while you engage in life. All right. So let's do one more. And again, I know. So as these calls go on and we get more members, we're going to get more questions there. 
what, what's really going to be running, what we're going to end up doing is pick a couple and answer different topics of them. So again, they won't be specifically answered, but I'm hoping you guys see how it really just opens a discussion on generally how to treat, you see, it doesn't matter what the specific questions are. You see how we're all kind of giving the same sort of responses in just slightly different ways. So I just want to make sure everybody, um, everybody's aware of that. It's not the sensation. It's not the situation. It's not the feeling. It's not the thought. It's the treatment of it. It's how, you know, how we treat, how we feel. So what, what should we do for one more idea? Well, I think we should definitely address <coughs> EP and DR. There were a few questions on the sheet, but also in the chat. It's usually the sensations that, that scare people the most, which I totally get it was the same for me. I think for you too, Drew. Oh yeah. We yeah, are like scary shit. Thing. It really is scary shit. Um, yeah, would you would you like to share? Yeah, Can sure. So yeah. I think I well, I don't even know if it was yesterday. You know that thing where you don't even remember your own content or when it was? I think it was yesterday. I did a post. <laughs> yeah. Um it was the hardest sensation for me to deal with. And I had I, I would be focused on, on incapacitation or death for the most part. But when I got depersonalized, I felt like I was disintegrating. I don't know how another word to use. I felt like I was the fragmentation. Yeah, I, yeah fragmentation. I, was I was I was slipping away. I don't know what slipping away actually meant, but those are the words that I could use. It, this is so hard to talk about because there's no words for it. <laughs> and what I would do when I would first experience DPDR was I understood what I had to do, but I treated it as if it was a special thing. No, 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 no. This really needs some sort of response. And it used to happen to be a lot while I was driving because I had a lot of driving anxiety. I would count the bumps on the steering wheel. You know how the steering wheel has little grippy bumps? I would count them and then backwards. I would open the window. If it was summer, I'd get a blast of hot air. If it was winter, I'd get a blast of cold air. I would do all, I would count backwards. I would pinch myself. I would scratch myself. I don't have nails, but I would try to scratch myself. Yeah. Anything to prove that I wasn't slipping away or disintegrating, that I was still real and alive. Mm -hmm. And when it didn't, work which was most of the time because you know if you scratch yourself it works for about eight seconds right. and then then you're right back to where i it, things escalated from there it's not working i can't i can't hold on i'm slipping away and nothing i do to hold on is working i had to literally decide i felt like this a thousand times before it's never actually hurt me so i'm going to have to just one by one stop doing all of those things and I would literally have to reframe it with one quick statement, which says, this never hurt me. And I'm still clearly in control of everything because I'm driving, I'm talking, I'm doing everything. So I'm just going to have to keep driving and keep talking while I feel this way temporarily, mm -hmm. which was super hard and felt completely reckless and wrong. And like, I shouldn't be doing that, but it changed everything, everything. And this is a topic I'm pretty passionate about because if I have an anxious day, I can, I can feel anxiety now. I'm not free of anxiety. I'm a human being. So if I feel it, it's the first symptom I'm going to feel. It's the mm -hmm. very first symptom I'm going to feel. And I always have to remind myself like, here we go again, you know, here we go. And, but it never lasts for more than a couple of minutes now, no matter how intense it is, because I don't treat it as something worthy of anything. I don't care why it happens. I don't need to know if I'm protecting myself from something I stopped doing all of that. This mm -hmm. is a symptom like every other symptom, scary though it may be. And that was a long process. It took, it took months for that to begin to start to happen, but it would last a little longer and the episodes would be fewer and further between. And that's how it is now. So if I get derealized now, it lasts for a few minutes. I just carry on with what I'm doing. I notice it and then it just kind of goes away. So who knows why it happens? I don't know, but that's my derealization, depersonalization story. I can still feel it today. I was feeling it at the beginning of this call, to be honest with you. Would you ever know? No, no of course not. Of no. course not. You, you, you can never see it. And I also experience it from time to time, but it's just like a fleeting moment that comes and maybe stays for a few seconds. And, you know, you get so good at labeling it the right way. Like, oh, there it is. Oh, that's DP. Oh, that's DR. And it just it just moves on. But it is it is very, very distressing, especially if you don't know what is going on. And why is that? Because everything that has to do with our perception is what scares us so much. Because keep, keep in mind, people who do not know what DP and DR are, they uh, almost all of them think, oh, my God, this is psychosis. Because when this we is the next of, level anxiety and this uh, is me on my way to crazy. Yeah. 
because when we think of psychosis, right, we, we think of delusions and hallucinations and then everything becomes weird and scary. And when our perception changes in that way, we, we part of us, the rational part of us can notice the part of us that feels changed in perception. So it's almost like we're feeling two things at the same time, that part that is a change in perception and that part that doesn't have the part that notices that part. And that feels very, very, so this is why, very scary. And that's why people say, I feel like I'm split in two parts. Have you heard that through before? Yeah. I feel like I'm split in two parts. Right? And, um, and anxious people are usually fixated on these positive symptoms, what clinicians uh, call hallucinations and delusions. So things that happen to people while they're in psychosis. But those things are not always evident in psychosis. It's more the flowery speech and you know impaired cognitions that happen to people who go through psychosis. But anxious people are fixated on the positive things like, oh, you see, now my perception has changed. That is a clear sign that I'm going crazy. This is why they attach so much fear to it. But as Drew said, in most cases, DPNDR are due to high anxiety. Now, in some cases, in rare cases, but it happens, DPNDR are a lack of emotion regulation. We all know it, it's been triggered as a protective mechanism, but for some people, when they experience some, so, some sort of trauma, and trauma can be really anything that just exceeds our coping strategies, they will stay stuck in the DPDR until they resolve those feelings. So it's not about going back to childhood traumas and you know working through all of that, but really learning to feel. We also say DPDR is often a phobia of feelings. If I, if I can't process emotions properly, I have again to turn to an alternative and that is in many cases DP and DR. So learning how to process all kinds of feelings, learning how to deal with anxiety, to allow it, to flow with it, to not appraise it in a catastrophic way. And then also learning to not appraise the sensation itself in a catastrophic way. Because what happens often is that it, DP and DR gets triggered initially as a response to high anxiety or trauma, but then turns into a self-perpetuating state because we start to fear the sensation itself. So now we have to battle two things, right? So try and see where you're stuck. Is it really something in your life that, that you feel is very difficult or was very difficult lately? Try to work through that, but then also always work on, on how you appraise the sensation itself. Right. And either way, DPDR is not danger. Not danger. Feels <laughs> weird. And then if I, no matter what I'm doing, if I'm doing something to try and get rid of that's definitely like, if you're trying to get rid of something, your alarm job will clearly show you what you're trying to get rid of. And so it's learning how to, just like the blushing from the first question to the DPDR to the last question, it'll always be the same, how I treat that feeling, not is the feeling gone, it's here's that feeling, you know, how, I, how, how am I treating that feeling? How am I allowing it to be there? Or am I treating it as a threat? I started to frame it and look, this is just my, what helped me. And I thought, okay, you know what? As I go through my day, we're, there's an environment we're in and we're aware of it. There's us and we are aware of ourselves too. I found that DPDR, I said, well, this is just a, temporarily, a temporary change in the way I perceive myself and myself in my relation to this environment. I'm not mm -hmm. supposed to notice this, but right now I am. That doesn't make it worse. It just makes it different. That was hugely helpful for me to realize like, okay, it's just different. It's not bad. It's just different. Even though it was bad, I hate it. Yeah, but it was bad. <laughs> I hate it. I really hate it. So I won't, I, I can say that. Anyway. So Drew, yeah. any last words you want to leave? Anything, like what's your, your best advice or what's your biggest pet peeve? Like anything you want to leave with us or talk about your books again? Like I, I, everybody wants as much of you as possible, so. Well, my biggest pet peeve is the skin on a peach. <laughs> why is there fuzz on that? Why? Like, why? 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 To why? shave them before they go to the grocery oh, store. Who am I talking about that? So that's my biggest <laughs> peeve. Like, I love peaches. If you peel it for me, I'll eat it. But otherwise, me too. I'm the same. Crazy. Yes. I, I can't right. touch it. If somebody would throw a peach at me, I would drop it. I would not even touch if it. You, if you walked in the room with a peach right now, it's going to get filled. <laughs> well, I'm going to make sure you don't get to me with that peach. So we do have nectarines, which are the greatest invention ever. I don't care if they're genetically engineered or not. Anyway. Oh, yeah. Kiwis. You must not like kiwis either. So I just uh, oh, yeah. Kiwis. Anyway, uh, <laughs> you know what? I don't really. It's so hard. Like, what's your best advice? You are capable every single day. You just don't know it yet. That's what I tell people all the time. You are capable. You just don't believe it yet. But you will. Trust me as you go. And that's it. I don't know what else. That's a lot to I don't have a, a nugget of recovery advice. I can stick into 10 seconds. 
So what's your, your 10 second best advice? Who's mine? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> My advice is to spend more time out here living life because the problem you're trying to solve is not the problem, right? So let, let go of the problem solving stuff, go live life, do a lot less work with anxiety. If you're spending 10 hours trying to heal from anxiety, that's 10 hours too many. If the focus is on anxiety and like, I will listen to Drew and let's go watch Michelle and when she posts. Yeah. Check in with us. But like Drew, I don't know if you'll hear us say like, we have the worst business model ever. It's like, yeah. oh, definitely follow us. But then like spend as little time with us as possible. The Listen to what day, I say. The happiest day is the day that you unfollow me. That's what yes. I would say. Yes. When you forget a phone call, when you forget we have a phone call booked or you're late to a group right. because you were at a baseball game with That's your good. kid. Yeah. 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 So. Yes. And fuck confidence, you guys. Fuck it. So many people think, oh, I must be confident enough or I must believe in myself. I, I can count the times that I believed in myself. When I started weight training with 16, I didn't believe in myself. When I had a kid, I didn't believe in myself. When I started a new job, I didn't believe in myself. It's not a bad confidence in believing in yourself. That's absolutely irrelevant. Just do it. Right. That do stuff it. comes after. That comes okay. after. Like you yeah. grow confident, action comes, and then your confidence comes. You're not going to feel ready first and then go do stuff. Like the Three doing C's. has to happen first. Three C's. Courage spurs action, which builds competence. Repeated displays of competence build confidence. We don't get to decide to be confident. Is that kind of like an acronym? Because I don't know it's, it's like it's, or... yeah, you say it like this. <laughs> 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 don't wait. Don't wait to be ready. Don't wait until you feel like it or until you have gathered enough enough strength or whatever. Just do it. It is okay. You can think of yourself an, as an absolute loser and still do a great job. Right. Okay. Amen. And so some, just real quick, Drew, somebody was asking about your books. Which one should you start with? What's okay. the new book? Where oh, do I get good question. I would say if you don't know. Now, if you're in a DARE webinar, then uh, you're in a little bit in a different situation because you already understand a lot of these principles. But the, the key, here, this book right here. Look, I have a copy of it. I'm so terrible at this. This is the one that you would start with, The Anxious Truth. Okay. 7% slower is, is really good. It's really actually an applied mindfulness tool, and it's an easier, funnier, faster this is like a 400 page textbook. And then an anxiety story, you can find all of these at theanxioustruth.com. An anxiety story is just my own story and you can get that free. Smash word zero dollars or an <laughs> in your email address and I'll just email you an MP3, I don't care. So. And where can people find you? Instagram, Facebook? Yeah, theanxioustruth.com has all of my links. So you can just go to theanxioustruth.com slash links and you'll find me everywhere. The.anxious.truth on Instagram, but just, just go there. It's, it's all over. Okay, <laughs> awesome. Cool. Awesome. Well, Drew, if you so ever like to come back, let us know. You're always welcome on. I love sending the same message. And um, it's very nice to have you here. I think everybody is very much looking forward to this call. I agree. You guys are so welcoming and so friendly. Thank you so much. I appreciate you hosting like this. You're, You're welcome. welcome. See you next time. All right. Time. Bye, everybody. We'll see you Thank soon. Thank you, everybody. For Take attending. care. Take care. Bye. Later. Thank you for listening to the D.A.R.E. podcast. The D.A.R.E. app has over 1 million downloads and is helping people all around the world to overcome anxiety and panic attacks. You can download the app for free at DareResponse.com.